Hello everyone. Welcome to MBBS classes. Myself, Dr. Hanifa. Today in this video, I'll be talking on septoplasty. So dear friends, we have already discussed in my previous videos the anatomy of nose, anatomy of nasal septum and the deviated nasal septum in the individual videos. So as we know now, the deviated nasal septum is important because it is a common cause of nasal obstruction. And so the surgery to correct the deviated nasal septum is called septoplasty. The term septoplasty is derived from the Greek word with the meaning to reshape or mold the septum. It is one of the common procedures which is performed by rhinologists and by the ENT surgeons. Now let's recall the indications of septoplasty. First and most important indication of septoplasty is when the DNS is causing significant nasal airflow obstruction and in that case the primary aim of septoplasty is improving the nasal airflow. The other indications are the problems that arises due to DNS like epistaxis, sinusitis, obstructive sleep apnea and headache. Sometimes the septum abnormality may not be causing any symptoms. In that case, septoplasty may be needed when the surgeon is, fine, is having a difficult access while doing the endoscopic sinus surgery. Lastly, septoplasty is done for obtaining the cartilage graft for the other reconstruction purposes. So now let's have a quick look into the anatomy of the nasal septum. So the septum is, if you remember, septum is a vertically oriented mucosa covered bony and the cartilaginous structure that divides the nasal cavity into two. It is composed of cartilage and the bone. The cartilaginous contribution of the septum is in majority by the quadrilateral cartilage. This quadrilateral cartilage, it forms the interior part of the septum. The other minor contributions are by the septal process of two major alar cartilage and the columella. This columella, this is the columella, it is formed by the fusion of the medial pleura of the alar cartilage. The bony contribution of the nasal septum is by the, mainly by the two bones. It is the perpendicular plate of ethmoid which forms the posterior superior part of the septum and it is attached superiorly to the skull base and the cribriform area. The next bone which contributes is the vomer which contributes to the posterior inferior part of the septum. The other minor contributions are by the, by the bones such as nasal spine or frontal bone, nasal bones and the maxillary crest. This maxillary crest is formed by the palatine process of maxilla and the horizontal plane of palatine bone. Remember that this bony and the cartilaginous septal floor, it is stabilized in a groove on this maxillary crest. Moreover, in view of the septoplasty, you must remember that the cartilage has the dense fibrous attachment to the bones and the, attach and the area of the cartilage and the bony junctions are most susceptible for the mucosal tear while performing septoplasty. Now let's see the preoperative patient evaluation. Before planning the patient for septoplasty, certain preoperative workup is essential. So the first and foremost duty is to rule out the other potential causes of nasal obstruction. This is done by proper history tracking and the nasal endoscopic examination. So let's see the causes of nasal obstruction which should be diagnosed and managed before planning for septoplasty. The nasal obstruction, it could be due to allergic rhinitis, rhinitis medicamentosa, nasal polyps and neoplasms, adenoids causing the blockage of the nasopharyngeal airway, and certain anatomical abnormalities like coronal and the piriform stenosis, lateral nasal wall collapse, and the severe nasal deformity may be due to previous trauma and anatomical uh, variation like conca bullosa. The other issues that must be addressed are 
If a patient is having giving a history of obstructive sleep apnea and intolerance to CPAP, in that case, always evaluate the entire upper airway. While examining the patient of a deviated nasal septum, always note down the site of septal deflection. And the most important is discuss with the patients about the procedure. Try to know about the reasonable expectation from the patients. The role of radiology, if we see the CTPNS may be advised because it is helpful to know about the detailed anatomy of septum. Moreover, it will help us to evaluate other associated sinonasal conditions. After proper evaluating the patients, then the septoplasty, there are different techniques. It can, it can be done by uh, traditional techniques and it, nowadays it is also done by using the nasal endoscope, that is the endoscopic directed septoplasty. But the choice of technique of septoplasty, it depends on the location, type of DNS and lastly the surgical expertise and the preference of the surgeon. For septoplasty, the, there are different types of incisions which can be made. So the incisions, there are mainly three types, Killian's incision, modified Killian's incision and Freer's incision. These incisions are, they differ from one another based on the site of incisions. Now let's see the Killian incision. If you see that this is the nasal septum, this is the caudal end and this is the dorsum of the nasal septum. The Killian's incision is made 2 to 3 cm posterior to the mucocutaneous junction and it is always made from below upwards direction. Modified Killian's incision here, when this same Killian's incision is extended along the floor of the nasal cavity. If you see here, if we look into the base of the uh, nasal cavity, after the extension, it, we have to the incision line will go like this. Then the third is the Freer's incision or the hemitransfixian incision. Here, the, this incision is mostly used when the patient is having anterior DNS and the incision is made at the caudal margin of the nasal septum. Now let's see the steps of the traditional septoplastic. The first and most important step is the preparation of the nose. This is achieved by adequate decongestion of the nose and by local anesthesia. The local anesthesia is with the vasoconstrictor agents, usually one person lidocaine with one is to one leg epinephrine is injected into the mucosa in the submucopericondrial area. Then we have to wait for 10 to 15 minutes for the anesthetic agent to come into full effect. After we get the adequate nasal decongestion, the next step is to expose the caudal margin. The, this is the caudal margin. This is exposed by retracting the columella to the opposite side by using either the small nasal speculum or by the columella retractor. And then with the help of 15 size blade, the incision is made and the choice of incision again, I repeat, it depends on the side of deflection. For anterior, the Freer's or Hemitransfixian incision is preferred and for the little bit posterior deflections, Killian's or the modified Killian's incision is used. After the incision is made, then we have to identify the submucopericondrial plane. So now let's see, if you see that this is the cartilage, the cartilage is just above the cartilage, it is covered by the perichondrium and the cartilage and the bones, they are covered by the mucosa. So the plane of dissection is below this perichondrium layer. This is the submucopericondrial layer, plane. So after identifying this sub, uh, sub perichondral plane, this is the relatively avascular plane and it is uh, during the dissection time, it is identified by the whitish gritty cartilage and the perichondrium, it looks glistening. And the flap is elevated using the 
Freer's elevator. This is the instrument which is used for elevating the flap. The dissection goes on in the submucopericondyl plane and the flap elevation it extends to include the, all the areas of deflection and until we get the bone and the cartilage junction. After reaching the bone and the cartilaginous junction, the, uh, the cartilage is separated from the bone which is uh, present posteriorly and now the dissection begins in the subperiosteal plane that is below the periosteum in the bony part of the septum. Next is the mucopericondyl flap is now raised on the contralateral side. After one side flap elevation is done, the incision is made on the cartilage and the flap is elevated on the opposite side. So if we are using a hemitransfixion incision, then the contralateral side can be approached through the same incision. But if we are using the modified Killian's incision, then the access to the opposite side is made by incising the cartilage just anterior to the deflected portion. So after the planes, uh, after the mucopericondyl flaps are elevated satisfactorily, visualizing all the sides of deflection, the offending deviated cartilage and the bone is removed. The, remove, the removal of the cartilage is done, always keeping in mind to leave behind a generous L strut. This is that the strip of the cartilage which is left approximately of width 1 to 1.5 cm so as to maintain the nasal tip. Over, over resection of the cartilage should not be done because again it will lead to complications like deformity, nasal tip ptosis and the patient will have again a, a feeling of nasal obstruction. Spurs, if and if they are present, then they are removed using the controlled osteotomies. Lastly, the irrigation of the submucopericondyl flap is done with using the saline and the antibiotic solutions and the flaps are re-approximated using the absorbable suture. Caudal septal deformities are the another type of uh, debated nasal septum which must be addressed in a little bit different way. There are two techniques for uh, dealing with the caudal septal deformities. One is the technique is the swinging door techniques and second technique is the door stop technique. In the swinging door technique, if you remember that the septal floor it rests on a groove of the maxillary crest. So the septal cartilage is elevated out of this maxillary crest groove inferiorly and the inferior strip of the cartilage that rests on the maxillary groove is excised thus allowing the remaining cartilage to swing freely in midline because it is already attached superiorly to the skull base. Next, the lower end of this cartilage is secured caudally to the nasal spine of the uh, maxilla with the help of absorbable suture. In the door stab technique, what is done, it is a little bit different from the swinging door technique. The, the septal cartilage is, uh, again, it is detached from the maxillary crest. But here, after detaching it, it is displaced to the opposite side of the crest. Suppose if a patient is having right side of caudal deformity, the, the septal cartilage will be, uh, will be dissected out and it will be pushed to the left side and it is sutured in place. The post-operative care after septoplasty, sometimes we need to do the nasal packing or splints are used to prevent the bleeding nose post-operatively and to prevent the development of septal hematomas. Then antibiotics are given specially with the adequate coverage of Staphylococcus aureus, of course, to prevent the toxic shock syndrome. Among the complications, the most common complication is that the persistence of the subjective feeling or the complaint of nasal blockage. There could be the septal hematoma. Septal perforation happens when the, there is a mucosal tear on both the sides at the same places. Then that what happens since the cartilage, it gets its blood supply from the overlying mucosa, then it undergoes necrosis and there is a development of permanent septal perforation. Then 
the changes in the nasal shape due to the over resection of the septum like tip, uh, nasal tiptosis, dorsal nose saddling and they could be the post operative oozing from the nose. Now let's see the endoscopic septoplasty. Endoscopic septoplasty is done with the help of zero degree endoscope. The main advantage of endoscopic septoplasty is the visualization that is a constraint with the traditional technique that is done using the headlight. The second advantage of endoscopic septoplasty is the good magnification. Here under endoscopic visualization, the incision is made. If you see here, this is the spur. The incision is made directly over the spur in an anterior posterior direction. The submucopericondyl flap, they are elevated superiorly and inferiorly like this. And the septal deformity is resected. After that, the flaps are reapproximated with the help of absorbable sutures. With this, I come to an end of this video. Thank you for watching this video.